hello everybody. I'm Stora Mushri, Conservation Education Manager with the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. And for today's video, our recording is going to be with Dr. Nicole Tatman. She is our Big Game Program Manager, and her talk is specifically going to be about New Mexico Department of Game and Fish Aviation. And I believe we're going to be learning quite a bit about helicopters and possibly airplanes today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Tatman. Thanks, Storm, for that introduction. Yep, and you're right. I am going to be talking today about our agency's aviation program and sort of the uh, missions that we undertake within our agency aviation-wide. So we use both fixed wing and rotary aircraft, and rotary is just a fancy word for rotation or helicopter, essentially. So um, they're essential to many of our programs. That includes our wildlife surveys, uh, radio telemetry tracking. So the, the airplane, I'll show you a picture of it in a moment, is equipped, or, or many aircraft that we use are equipped with tracking devices so we can uh, hone in on animals that have radio transmitter devices on them. Uh, we use aviation for wildlife capture missions, including net gunning or chemical immobilization. We do long lining work, and we also use aviation for some law enforcement uh, missions. So um, probably what I'm going to focus on most are wildlife surveys. And for these, we have, we acquire data that we use um, to make management recommendations for particular wildlife species. We fly surveys to track how wildlife species are doing. Um, if they're not doing well, we can sort of hone in on what might be going wrong. Um, so sometimes we deploy radio telemetry. And so we can, we can use aviation to track wildlife populations in this manner. Um, and this might yield some important information or data on, for example, maybe survival rates of elk calves, if there's an area that we've surveyed and it doesn't look like there are very many elk calves, we can sort of um, make a, a bigger project out of it and try and determine why there aren't as many elk calves as we might expect. Um, so our, many of our aviation missions are surrounded or are, are uh, based on our desire to offer hunting opportunity. And we want to adjust that hunting opportunity based on the management objectives that may include some data gathered from aerial surveys. So we want to perhaps look at population trends or abundance of different species that are hunted. So we don't necessarily want to detrimentally impact populations that are hunted. Um, so we, we fly aerial surveys to make sure that we aren't doing that, but we're making also making sure that we can actually uh, sustainably harvest the number of, of animals that we are harvesting out of a population. So when we're flying aerial surveys, we're looking at population trends or abundance. And so this can result in either a total population estimate for a particular herd um, or a density estimate maybe for, for a particular area. We also look at the male and female and juvenile ratios. And so that piece of information gives us, um, gives us data on essentially how productive the population is. So we don't, males are, are, are more heavily harvested than females. Um, and so one male generally can breed several females and so we, we typically harvest males a little more because one male can, har can um, breed many females. And then all those females have young. Um, and so we can use the, the juvenile ratio or how many, how many young we see during aerial surveys to sort of assess how productive that population is. How many young are surviving? Is that what we might expect? Or is it too low? Or is it exceptionally high? And then we can sort of adjust our management recommendations based on what we see occurring in the population. We also might look at the age structure of males and for uh, many of our horned or antlered species that we hunt, we can uh, get, we can assess age structure based on horn or antler growth. So typically older males have bigger horns or antlers. Um, and so we can kind of assess 
what's going on with the population if we want, wanted to manage to have older males in the population or younger males. Uh, we also take a look at the total number and the sex of the animals and assess the habitat condition and make sure there's not too many animals um, out there on the landscape that are detrimentally impacting the habitat. So our surveys are used to uh, compare our population status to management objectives and then inform our decisions about hunt structures. So um, a few species that we do surveys on are bighorn sheep. For these, we use helicopter surveys. Um, deer, we also use helicopter surveys. These are often, often flown for, for a variety of these species. They're kind of flown year round, um, but we, we will focus in on certain times of year that are more important for those species. So for example, for deer, we typically fly in the winter because that's when deer are breeding. And we wanna make sure that we see males, females and young when we're flying our survey. So we get um, an assessment of how that population is doing if they're productive, like I was mentioning previously. Um, for elk, we also fly helicopter surveys. And, and again, we fly these during a specific time period during their breeding season, which is in the fall. Um, and, and I should mention that during the breeding season for deer and elk species, that's when those animals are most likely to be sort of evenly distributed on the landscape. And what I mean by that is they're, they're all commingling together at that time. All age and sex classes are together during that time period. Whereas during other times of the year, male deer or male elk might be off somewhere else and not associating with females because that's their biology. They typically, the males and females only get together during the breeding season. And so we wanna fly during the times when we can actually observe all of those animals together. And so um, the timing of these surveys is pretty important. We have um, a couple of exotic species in New Mexico that we fly surveys for. One of those is uh, Persian ibex. We fly surveys for those guys with a helicopter. Uh, pronghorn, that's a native species, and we fly fixed wing surveys for pronghorn. Um, oryx, we also fly fixed wing surveys for. That's another exotic species. It's a, an African antelope species, um, also called Gimsbach. And we fly waterfowl surveys with our fixed wing aircraft as well. So depending on the mission, we sort of can tailor what aircraft we can use for that particular job. Helicopters are a bit more expensive to use, but they're very maneuverable. They can fly a lot slower and they can fly a lot lower to the ground um, in a safe way. Fixed wing aircraft are very versatile in that they can travel distances pretty quickly. Um, they're not quite as maneuverable, but for some species that isn't really a concern. Um, so very visible species like pronghorn or oryx, the fixed wing aircraft is, is, it works just fine for surveys. Our, our first priority for all of our surveys is always the data collection. And so we don't just survey populations because it's fun. While it is very fun, we survey so we can gather information and better manage uh, those, those wildlife species and populations. So for any aerial survey, we want representative data. And what I mean by that is kind of what I was mentioning before. We don't want to survey during the summer when we only see adult female elk and they're young and we, we don't have any information on the bulls. We wanna fly during those times of year that uh, the animals are most evenly distributed across the landscape or evenly distributed amongst one another. So um, again, for, for elk, I'm going to use that example probably quite a bit here. Uh, we're flying in the fall when all those animals are sort of um, commingling together. And we also, for aerial surveys, would like to have consistent timing for data collection. So it's, it kind of stands to reason if you survey one year, if you survey elk population one year in the fall when they're breeding, and then the next year you decide you want to survey in the early summer when elk, when female elk are giving birth, you're not going to have comp comparable data, right? If you're surveying in the summer, you're only count, you're, you're probably likely counting those adult females 
but some of them may not have given birth yet. So you're not getting, you're not really getting a representative sample of what's going on out there. So we typically try and keep our aerial surveys for each species around the same time frame every year. Um, and we also want unbiased data. And that's, that's kind of a fancy statistical word for saying that um, we don't, we don't want to just survey where we know there's animals all the time. Um, for de deer, for example, they might be kind of patchy on the landscape. So you might find a whole bunch of them in one place, maybe around, I don't know, the Farmington area, but somewhere else, maybe in the southwestern part of the state, they're sort of more lightly scattered across the landscape. And so we don't want to just count those populations that we know are um, are, are densely populated. We want to get an idea of the whole landscape, how animals are sort of distributed across the landscape, how many there are, and not just focus our efforts on areas that we would count the most animals because that would lead to some bad recommendations if we just counted a whole bunch of animals in one area and assumed that was the case across the whole state of New Mexico. We would, we would make some poor um, biological decisions based on that. So I will go into a little more detail with elk. I mentioned that um, this is the species I'm gonna focus on the most. We survey these guys in the fall during their rut and, and we use um, a population model called population reconstruction. And that's a fancy word and I'm not gonna go into all the details of it because um, it's, it's kind of complicated. But what we need for this model to work is ratio data. So earlier on, I mentioned we, we when we're, we're counting elk and classifying them from the sky, we need bull to cow to calf ratios. And so that's what I'm looking for here. We're looking for that ratio data um, during a time of year when all of the elk are intermixed and commingling. So that's why we're flying these surveys during the rut or during the breeding season for these animals. We, a good example of this kind of a, of a biased data situation. It used to be that our agency flew surveys during the winter, but during the winter, elk are not breeding any longer and males decide to move off into some more rugged country to take some rest from the breeding season. They, they really expend a tremendous amount of energy during the breeding season. So they sort of isolate themselves in the winter out away from the larger herds. And so when we flew these winter surveys, we were getting biased male data. And what I mean by that is that we, we weren't seeing the males because they were in um, really heavily treed areas. And in a helicopter, you can see pretty well, but you can't really see through the treetops. And so we weren't able to see those males and um, we were getting some, some information that really wasn't useful for our management. So we switched to surveying these animals during the ruts in the fall to get that ratio data so we can actually include the males in our population models. And that's pretty important for our New Mexico, especially, and, and actually most Western states that harvest elk, because usually we are harvesting males more heavily, again, because one male can breed many females and you're really not detrimentally impacting the population, at least reproductive wise or productivity wise, if you're harvesting some males off the top. Because if you harvest some males, there's still going to be some males there to breed all the females. And then all those females will have young. And we also have some different male harvest strategies. Um, so for example, in some places, we harvest males um, in a manner where they, they reach older age classes and they get bigger antlers. Where in other areas, we manage elk for... Um, for oppor more opportunity. And what I mean by that is there are more chances to go hunting, but the males don't get as large of, um, of antlers. So we want to make sure we're doing, we're assessing our harvest strategies as well. And so assessing that male segment of the population is pretty important for us. We also fly our aerial surveys during the hours of greatest activity for elk. Um, and so this is during the early morning and later in the evening before the sun goes down. So this is when the, we have the highest probability of elk being out in the open. If we just flew 
um, helicopter surveys all day, we would probably just be wasting money in the middle of the day because elk are, are bedding up in the trees and not really as visible or as active in the middle of the day. And so we focus our efforts during the hours of greatest activity first thing in the morning and um, right before the sun goes down. And again, what we're looking for here for elk is that ratio data. That's what's really important. And that goes into our models to develop a population size. And then from that population size um, that we generate when we're back at our desks, after all this data has been collected, we can estimate how many animals can sustainably be harvested from that population and not detrimentally impact the population or, or grow it or decrease it or whatever objective we might have for the population. Generally, it's to maintain a stable population. But from that population estimate, we can, ge we can um, generate an, a number of sustainable harvest limits for that population. And so that goes into how uh, we, have, we set our, our um, hunting seasons for elk and the quantity of elk that can be harvested. Okay, switching gears a little bit more um, into bighorn now. So for bighorn, we have a little bit different strategy for surveys. We are using what's called a mark recite model. And we fly helicopters for this species as well. Um, and then there are some detection conditions that we record during our survey. And this might sound kind of technical, but I hope that my description is, is going to walk you through what I mean here. So when we're surveying these guys, it, it stands to reason that if there is just one single animal standing underneath a bush and a helicopter flies by and that animal never moves, it's going to be less obvious to us in the helicopter compared to a group of maybe 12 bighorn sheep running across an opening. Those are going to be, those are going to catch our eye uh, way more easier than that single animal standing in the bush. So when we record uh, the conditions, we are recording animal activity. So whether they're moving or stationary, and again, you could, you could imagine that something stationary is, is a little harder to see than something moving. Um, the percent cover, and that is the percent of vegetation that's surrounding them. So sometimes desert bighorn sheep live in, or bighorn sheep in general, live in areas that are really wide open. But sometimes there's some vegetation and brush, um, maybe juniper trees in there that they may be hiding in or under. So we, uh, we note that because as, as you can imagine, they're harder to see when they're hiding in a tree than if they're just out in the open. We also note the lighting conditions. So sometimes we often fly these surveys first thing in the morning and the sunlight can be hitting you directly in the eyes at certain angles. Um, and it might be hard for you to squint your eyes and see everything that's going down, going on down on the ground. Um, so we could, we note the lighting conditions, which could also impact your ability to detect that animal. And we note the position relative to the helicopter. So is it, so if we're looking out on a slope that's kind of eye level to us and we're scanning up and down that slope for bighorn sheep, is the animal right below us? Because it's, it's harder to look under the helicopter when you're flying than it is to look just directly out of the helicopter. Are they directly out or are they above it? So those factors can impact how easy it is to detect those animals and, um, and count them. And then we also note the composition and composition means how many males, how many females, how many lambs or young. Um, and this is an example, uh, the, the photograph that you see in the background of this slide, an example of um, maybe some composition data that we might collect from this group of animal, animals. And this, this picture was taken from a helicopter. So you can see that we can get rather close to these guys. Um, even a couple of them have ear tags, as you can see, those, those middle two have ear tags. So they've been captured by us before and we have some GPS colors on them. In any case, these four are males. So we would note that, that information. Um, and then we can kind of assess the age of bighorn sheep based on their horn sizes. And so these are, these are kind of younger males. Um, bigger males will have much larger horns that um, essentially kind of make a circle 
around their ear and kind of come back towards their eye. And so we assess the age class of bighorn sheep when we're flying these surveys as well. Oryx are interesting and I wanted to talk about them briefly because they're, they're kind of different. So biologically, this species, the males and females both have horns and look the same. So we, we can use horns or antlers to our advantage for some of these other species because not the, not the males and females don't always, the females do not always have horns um, or big horns for that matter. But for Oryx, males and females look identical from the air. And so um, when we fly these surveys, we are just counting a total sample in some certain areas. And so we're not looking for information that's as precise as we might get from the previous example with bighorn sheep surveying. We're just looking for a total count. And then sometimes we go back out on the ground and try and classify young, um, but it's sort of just an interesting situation in, in that we can't decipher males from females from the air. Um, so we have to get that data somewhere else outside of aerial surveys. Ibex are another interesting species to survey. We, we survey these guys with the helicopter and it's a complete survey of the entire mountain. And we classify the total number of animals we see in each group. And then we classify the mature males. Um, we, they're very, this species is not native to North America or New Mexico. And um, so they're only in one mountain range and we want to maintain them on one mountain range only. Um, they're really interesting species and they can scale cliffs kind of at a dead sprint. And so when we're surveying them at, uh, in a helicopter, they kind of scatter pretty quickly and are really easy. It, it, it's really easy for them to navigate these really cliffy type habitats. And so for other species, generally we like to gather information at, at a minimum on the number of young that we see. But for Ibex, that's almost completely um, impossible because the speed at which they can move underneath the helicopter and across cliffs and in various directions. And so we're, when we're surveying ibex, we survey the entire mountain and, and count all the ibex that we see. And then later we go back and do some supplemental ground surveys that can give us an idea of how many young we see and give us a ratio of young to female. And again, that, that young to female ratio is really important because it gives us an idea of the productivity of the population. So are females still having young? Um, are those young reaching adulthood? And that's, that's very important, especially for harvested species um, that we remove some animals via hunting. Okay, switching gears to net gun captures now. Uh, we use net gun captures, and I'll just give a brief uh, overview of this because somebody else will be describing this in much greater detail. Uh, but we, we capture animals with a net gun, which is pretty exciting. It's this gun that is equipped with a net on the front of it, on the muzzle, um, and it, it fires this, these weights out that then carry this net out and capture an animal. And there's a photo of, of that actually, that gun firing and the net coming out of the gun in this photograph in the slide. And so this is a doors off operation for the helicopter. Actually, a lot of our work is, but for, for this particular mission, we take all the doors off of the helicopter. So those, the, there's two front doors and two rear doors, and all of those doors are removed for this operation. So there's a lot, and there's all of these moving parts. You're getting really close to the ground on the helicopter. You're firing a projectile out of the helicopter, which gives some additional safety considerations. So there's really a lot that's going on and that can go wrong. So there's, it's really great to have experienced flyers on board during these captures. So they can help the pilot locate obstacles. They can look for animals to capture. They can, they're just kind of talking nonstop to make sure everybody's safe. Everything is going smoothly. Um, and that the animal, that the people and the animals are all safe. So they're flying at very low altitudes, really, really close to the ground. You can probably 
um, gather that from this, this photograph. And there's also a lot of maneuvering. Animals don't necessarily want to be captured. Um, and so they, they do a lot of maneuvering to try and get away from the helicopter. And in, in this case, we were doing this particular project um, by capturing desert bighorn sheep to move some of them off of this particular mountain to a new mountain to reestablish a, a population that was historically on this, this other mountain that was extirpated or um, that was lost over a hundred years ago. So in the scheme of things, a ca the capture of the animal, while it is not pleasant for the animal itself, it's pretty temporary and we don't ever do it just for a random reason or because it's fun. We do it for a real biological purpose. And in this case, it was to reestablish a population somewhere else. And so we're always mindful of both human safety and animal safety. And so for any kind of capture and net good captures in particular, we minimize our chase times or the amount of time that we're just pursuing one animal to less than two minutes. That way they don't get extremely stressed out and you can imagine they're running pretty fast to get away from the helicopter. Um, so they get pretty warm and they're panting. So we don't want to overstress them out because it actually might cause them to die. So we minimize our, our pursuit time and try to minimize actually our time interacting with the animal too for, for its own safety and, and ours. But um, we want to make it as comfortable as possible. Another aerial mission that we undertake uh, out of a helicopter is chemical immobilization. So this is, it's similar operations to a net gun capture that I described a little bit ago, but um, it's often in cases where animals, where we cannot use a net gun to capture the animals. So maybe they're in more dense vegetation. So if, if we actually tried to fire a net at them, it wouldn't catch them. Um, so in those cases, we'll use a, a net gun to dart those animals and sedate them and then go out and process them. We tend to like to use just net gun capturing because it minimizes our time in contact with the animal and it, it kind of minimizes their stress. They can, you know, while it is stressful for them, we can get in there, process them and get out uh, pretty quickly and they can get on with their life. Um, whereas if they're chemically immobilized, it's, it's some amount of time for them to, to uptake the drug, to be completely under for us to process them and then for us to reverse them. And then they still might have some impacts for several hours later. So we like to just do net gun captures when we can. But this mission is under the direction of a contract veterinarian because specialized drugs are used and fired out of the helicopter at these animals. So you can see this person in the photograph is ready to dart this elk. He has, uh, looks like he's gonna dart her in her hind quarter. And typically you want to um, get in a, in a decent muscle mass or um, muscle for that dart and the drug to actually uptake into the animal. So it looks like he's going for um, a left hind, hind quarter shot there. So I mentioned that we also do monitoring from our uh, fixed wing aircraft and we often cooperate with some other agencies, New Mexico State University, um, sometimes Fish and Wildlife Service to do some of this monitoring. So some brief safety for in and around aircraft. You obviously want to avoid air, airplane propellers and also helicopter main rotor blades and tail rotors, especially on slopes. The photograph you can see the gentleman is being let out on a slope. And, and again, I talked to you about this a second ago, but he doesn't want to walk up slope there because that rotor blade is, is sort of invisible to him, but it's certainly there. Um, and so what he's going to do is he's just going to get out of the helicopter and sit down right where he's at right there and let the pilot take off before he moves anywhere else. Uh, we always approach helicopters from the front when the engine is running. And honestly, I make it a point to approach them from the front just always. So it is a the habit for me rather than approaching them from behind because the rear of the helicopter is dangerous because there is a, there's a tail rotor there that's moving that 
is also invisible to you when it's moving. And if anybody's ever unsure of anything, it's just kind of uh, good practice to watch for the pilot for direction. Even actually, even if you do know what you're doing, it's good to watch the pilot for direction because they might see something that you don't see, or there might be a wind gust that you're unaware of or, or something that um, they, would might, they might want to make you aware of. So in this case, um, this is an animal that was um, darted and there's a helicopter um, in, the, in the background of this picture, but you can see that this helicopter just kind of landed on a slope. So when you're working up this animal um, and, and maybe the helicopter is still running and you need to get back to it, the animal, you've released the animal, she's okay, she got up and walked off and you're trying to get back to the helicopter. You gotta maintain, you gotta keep in mind where those rotor blades might go and where the slope is. So in this case, you might want to approach that helicopter further down slope rather than, or to, to the right of it, rather than to the left of it and upslope. Because if you're approaching from the upslope, that, that rotor, main rotor on the top of the helicopter can move around. And so it, it is going to be closer to the ground at some point than um, than it is on the right-hand side of the helicopter. So those are some things to keep in mind that we keep in mind when we're working in, around helicopters. Um, we, we secure all of our items within the cockpit of the helicopter itself. We do a lot of our missions with doors off, like I, I did tell you previously. And so this is especially important. We absolutely, everything that we have to take with us in the helicopter is secured to our person. So if we have a GPS unit, we make sure that it has, we have a carabiner on it and it's clipped to ourselves because it can easily fall out and then you're out a GPS unit. And in a worst case scenario, like a, a jacket can be ripped out, you know, the, the wind can like suck a, a jacket out of the helicopter and then it can hit one of the rotor blades and that's really no, nothing good is going to happen from that. So we make sure everything is attached to ourselves. Um, and if we don't need it in the helicopter, there's a little storage area in, in kind of um, a cargo rack, I guess, behind its its, its own little area um, that you can access and store snacks or additional uh, jackets or whatever. Um, we also use spot devices for our flights. And these are just sort of uh, additional tracking devices that somebody from an office can follow what the flight is doing and make sure it's in some logical locations. And um, if there are any problems, this spot device can be used to alert that other, other colleagues or the biologists that are back at their desks monitoring the flight that something has gone wrong and, and maybe they need help. Maybe it's just that there was a mechanical problem and the helicopter had to land, but they need a ride out of wherever they are, or it could be um, that somebody got sick, variety of reasons, but we use those devices for, for personal safety during flights. So weather conditions are some of the most um, common and important factors when deciding on when and where to do a lot of our flights. So, you know, anybody who's flown in, in any kind of an aircraft can probably, probably has experienced some turbulence associated with thunderstorms or rain or wind. Um, and so when we're flying, we're always paying very, very close attention to the weather and what it's doing and what it's predicted to do over the course of a day or the duration of whatever mission we're doing. So helicopters, aircraft can fly in, in some weather conditions, but there's some conditions that just make it impossible for, um, for flight. And in which case we might stay grounded for the day and not complete our mission that day, postpone it a day, um, but it's not uncommon for us to wait out a, wait out a storm or something um, so the weather is better and safer for us to fly. Something kind of interesting is, is flying in mountainous terrains. Mountains can kind of create their own weird turbulence. And the, the, low, the lower little graphic describes this pretty, pretty well. Um, the wind is, comes in a prevailing direction and then once it gets over the mountaintop, it kind of swirls about. And um, if you think that the wind is traveling from the west to the east, but you're on the a different side of the mountain, you might experience something very different in the aircraft itself. And so when when pilots are flying, they're, all, they're often taking this into consideration when they're navigating through mountainous terrain. The fact that it's real windy might want 
it might prevent them from flying on one side of the mountain. Um, and in some cases, the downdrafts can exceed the ability of the aircraft to, to climb to higher altitudes. And so downdraft would just be um, wind pushing down on the aircraft. And that's not a situation that any pilots or anybody in the aircraft would want to be in. So pilots are often very, very cognizant of flying in mountainous terrain. Uh, thunderstorms are also very, um, they're, they're one of the biggest threats to aircraft operations in that they are associated with a lot of wind, a lot of precipitation, um, and a lot of turbulence. Even before the, thunder, before the thunderstorm comes into an area, there's a lot of wind that's associated with it. And then when, it, when the thunderstorm moves out, there's often still wind associated with it. So there's a lot of complicating factors surrounding thunderstorms um, and unpredictable wind that aircraft have to deal with. And so again, sometimes we just wait until there's a better flying day to complete a mission when there's a thunderstorm in the area. So we're often communicating with the pilots um, and the, pass the pilots communicating with passengers. We're kind of always talking to one another when we're in the aircraft and we're telling, you know, the observers or biologists or conservation officers that are flying are telling the pilot of any obstacles they might see. So, oh, there's a wind turbine, a line of wind turbines in the distance. And the pilot says, okay, yep, I see them. Or there's some power lines that are coming up. Oh yeah, pilot tells you, yeah, I see them. So we're always talking to one another, but pilots really appreciate that because, um, you know, three sets of eyes is much better than one. And um, it's always, pilots are always happy to have you inform them of hazards that you see. So towers, power lines, birds, even um, a big enough bird can do some damage to an aircraft and you don't want to hit any bird anyway. Um, um, that is all the content I have Storm. So I will throw it back to you. Thank you, Nicole. I uh, appreciate you joining us today. And uh, um, it's one of those, it's always a joy to, to work with you. And I appreciate you um, sharing your knowledge with us today. And before I let you off the hook um, for today, I do have one question to ask of you. Um, I know that you, uh, obtained your master's and your PhD. And if you were to give any words of encouragement to individuals that wanted to go beyond their bachelor's degree, uh, what might that be? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Storm. My, my recommendations for folks who, want, who are interested in graduate school is, is just to get engaged in the topics that they're interested in. So talk to biologists, talk to conservation officers, um, foresters, people who are doing the kind of job that you're interested in and volunteer for some of those projects if you can. Um, if you can't volunteer free time, then take some, apply for some technician jobs within the field that you're interested in. One of the um, most beneficial things for me when I was, an undergraduate was, I worked for a professor. Um, I didn't work full-time for him because I couldn't study and do that full-time, but he was able to open doors for me in the fact that he could put me on projects to experience prairie dog trapping, for example, or lab work. And so I got to experience a variety of different things. Initially, when I went to grad school or when I went to um, undergraduates, I wanted to be a veterinarian or a zookeeper. I kind of had no idea that um, a wildlife biologist existed, but um, he exposed, the, the professor I worked for exposed me to a variety of, of different types of field work that you could get into that were still related to wildlife. I knew I wanted to do, do something with wildlife, but that was kind of different. And so actually doing some of those um, tasks, even if it was just for a weekend, was helpful for me by, by kind of teaching me what I really liked about one particular project or another. Um, I would also say just stay, generally stay interested in science and in wildlife it's, if it's something that you want to do. Colleges often 
offer some free seminars on research that they're conducting that are open just to the public. And so you don't have to pay. You just have to know when they are and, and just reaching out to them would, um, would probably get you in the loop to, to, um, for, for them to tell you when these seminars might be occurring. And so they'd be free. And even if you didn't understand all the research that they're talking about or everything that's going on in the presentation, it still exposes, you will still learn something about it and it'll expose you to sort of the projects that might be going on in the field. And, and maybe you are interested in those kinds of, kinds of projects or maybe not, which is also a good thing to know before you <laughs> go down the path of, of getting a graduate degree in a profession that you might not like. So um, I would say, yeah, just generally stay engaged and go, go meet people. It's kind of surprising how many, um, how many contacts you might get from just meeting a professor or a biologist or a game warden. Um, And if you really kind of maintain that and keep in contact with them, opportunities kind of arise because you're around and you're expressing interest. So that's probably, that's what I would say is, is some advice for somebody wanting to go to graduate school. Well, cool. Well, thank you for joining us again today, Nicole. And uh, I'm sure everybody is going to enjoy this recording. And with that, I want to say adios and we'll catch you on the next one. So thank you.